Hey now, it's uh, your buddy JC here for Taste Terminal. We are standing at uh, Lab Brewing Co. Actually, we're sitting, I'm pretty sure. Sitting, I'm a small I think. man. I can never tell if I'm up or down. I think we're people. down. I think we're down. <laughs> we are down. And I'm down to drink some beers. I'm here with uh, Roger Bott. Hello. Uh, otherwise known as Dr. Hops, which I thought was a, a nickname for a basketball player in the 70s. It turns out it's uh, Hops is in beer. Hops is in beer, not jumping, although I'm pretty good at both. Oh, I'm sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves, brother. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we're here at Lab, and, and uh, you are the head brewer yes. as well as one of the owners. Congratulations, That's Mr. Uh, excited uh, Big Shot. Um, Thank you. And you've been here brewing for a couple months now, getting your feet wet, and uh, yeah, we just got our uh, yeah, we just got our first couple batches uh, under our belts. We're doing batch seven currently. Okay. We're restocking on the Belgian triple. Nice. That seems to be a very hot seller. Yeah. Um, very high in alcohol, yet very easy to drink. It makes for a lot of happy people at the end of the night. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's always one of the liquid uh, happiness. Is yes, liquid a, a happiness. Good thing, so. Always works out. And you know, it's cool. I think um, you were talking about lab actually stands for something. It's also the scientific connotation, but it, it's... Yeah, uh, scientific. You know, there's a lot involved, you know, the beakers and the, the lab coats and everything, but also for the live art of brewing. Right. Um, we love, you know, arts. We have a lot of local artists that have done work in our facility. You know, we have murals done by another owner. We have my friends from Ventura did like four pieces that are featured throughout the venue as well as the um, the music itself you know right. we, we just love live art and I strongly feel that brewing itself is an art and being as though the brew house is encased in glass in the center of the facility mm -hmm. you could see it from everywhere you're at in the restaurant um, I like to think of that as um, you know a, a live art element that we offer to the public while they're dining well it absolutely is and, and it's funny because going in here every piece of it seems like art to me i mean even like even like your tap lineup it's beautiful yes. just in terms of how it's presented the restaurant itself is beautiful the food is in itself an art you know, absolutely. Like Pop. Absolutely. the beer itself is art and then you have music too so really that artistic sort of gourmet artisanal thing comes through it all and i think that's neat to present all those things together and realize there are so many types of art and each are beautiful in their own way. Yeah, so it's, and it's they neat can to put all that in. meld together so nicely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're really doing that. It's sort of a, a melting pot of art here. It's your Thank own you. little New York City inside of uh, Agura Hills. Inside that of is, Agura Hills. Yeah, inside of Agura Of course, where else would you expect that? It's like <laughs> the Paris of L.A. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of wonderful. And um, so tell me about your history. Where do you, where do you hail from? What's your, what's your story, my man? I was uh, born and raised in Camarillo. Um, I moved out to Hollywood. Hollywood when I was 18 because I thought Camarillo was the most boring place I ever lived and about half a year later I realized Hollywood sucks and <laughs> moved back and bought a house in Camarillo but uh, so I still live there mm -hmm. and I've been brewing there at my house for the past 16 years um, get more years. You were like five, years. six years old when you started. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's why I started. <laughs> <laughs> Pops wouldn't buy me beer. I somewhere. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, I've been taking it a little bit more seriously ever since. Um, taking a lot of courses on the subject matter, you know, from some some um, professionals and also got a chance to uh, tour around Holland and Belgium hey, you were mentioning for a little this. while. You did, you did some actual work in breweries abroad. Yes. What's that process like? Well, Where basically, were you? I, I posted myself up at some of the local pubs long enough mm -hmm. and pestered them you were a drunk time and time enough. again <laughs> they finally said okay come help us and then they realized that was actually some decent help so they allowed me to uh, stay on mm -hmm. um, and then they actually took me out and we played soccer and they realized I suck at that so they made me sit out of soccer games but they allowed me to continue brewing for a while I think you did better at that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be worse if they switched it around <laughs> love you for soccer but no 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 not so much on the, on the beer there what is so what is it like in terms of brewing culture out there I mean you really think of Europe being sort of the home of a lot of uh, brewing styles and conventions yes. and things like that. It's the Disneyland of beers, I like to call it. Is it pretty amazing? I mean, does there a sense of history and how do they Absolutely. do things versus out here? Absolutely. I mean, you're in a building that's, you know, probably a couple hundred years old, first of all. And then second of all, most of this equipment is, you know, several hundred years old. It's been passed down from generation to generation. Some of these, like, abbey monasteries are using yeast strains from the 1800s that they've still managed to keep alive. Right. And uh, that's kind of their proprietary thing that adds a whole lot of, you know, taste characteristics to the beer. A lot mm -hmm. of people kind of overlook yeast. Um, they say, oh, yeah, it's grains and hops and water, but uh, the yeast is a huge element of the flavor profile of the beer, which they highly emphasize in Europe, which is nice. Right, and, and, and actually, as we'll talk about the beers here in a second, I mean, certain styles are those styles largely because of the yeast. I mean, yes. if you look at, you know, talking about 
Europe, for instance, if you look at uh, a Bavarian Hefeweizen versus something like an American version of American Correct. wheat ale, Correct. I mean, that difference there is just essentially just yeast. Exactly. That's all it is. So how do you work in terms of uh, when you, you own something like this, how do you choose a strain of yeast and then do you propagate it um, yourself or and then from there, another question, do you use it in what percentage of your brews? Like, a lot sure. of questions there. No, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's a, it's a big I'm thing a to consider. <laughs> um, actually, right now, we're only working with two different yeast strains. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, we had to buy it. Um, I went from Y-Yeast initially. You have to buy it from a yeast provider sure. initially, and I didn't realize how expensive it would be. It's about $450 uh, to get enough yeast for one batch. Are you kidding uh, me? No. So, wow. But then after that, to start, you can just continue to reuse that yeast mm -hmm. as long as you have good aseptic technique right. and that yeast continues to be clean and alive and healthy. Um, so, you know, we've, we're on batch seven and we're still going strong with the same yeast. Um, and we plan to continue that to at least probably batch 15 to 20. Okay. And then we'll probably start up another one. Um, I do plan to start a yeast lab um, up eventually once things kind of simmer down and sure. I have a moment to breathe. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, helps culture yeast for a lot of the major breweries down in San Diego. So she says she's a microbiologist. She said she'd be happy to teach me some of the ways. So I'm looking forward to doing that. But in the meantime, I'll just buy different strains uh, every couple 10, 15, yeah. 20 brews. So right now we're using a, uh, it's called Chico yeast. Okay. It's called 1056. Okay. It's a very common American ale yeast that's suitable for... for basis, like for Sierra Nevada? I'm Sierra Nevada, okay. exactly. It's just suitable for all types of different styles. And then we're also using uh, Trappist Abbey 2 yeast, okay. which is the uh, the Belgian style that uh, currently we're using in the triple and the Vit beer that's uh, currently being carbonated. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you're yeah. talking. I'm bummed we are miss that, but we'll just have to come back again. You have to come back. That's There's always excellent. new flavors popping up. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's like, like Baskin <laughs> Robin. So, uh, we let's... do have 31 taps. You do? 31 flavors. There's no, uh, there's no coincidences <laughs> in the beer world. So it's, it's got to be an exciting experience for you to sort of dial up into a professional brewing system from homebrew. What, what's been like one of those challenges that you really face? Oh, well, there's several of them. I mean, it was... Uh, I only need one, so yeah, we don't it, have one. <laughs> it was very exciting, uh, very stressful. Um, but I think the major thing is just... Um, the, the scale of cleaning and what level of detail you have to get to when you clean because when you're home brewing you know you swish around a little sanitizer in your carboy <laughs> and you're good to go here we have the full-on CIP or clean in place setup where each each uh, tank has a rotating spray ball valve in it and it takes a caustic cycle with a hot water rinse and then an acid cycle with a hot water rinse and I think we all know this, a sir. CO2 purge. It's ridiculous. So just the, the complexities that are involved there. Right. And then the, the chiller has been kind of my worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. It's the heat exchanger that cools the beer down after boil from 212 degrees to 70 degrees mm -hmm. within just a couple minutes. And that has so many nooks and crannies in there. It's the highest source of potential contamination right, in the right. brew house. So I took that thing apart four different times and cleaned it before we even started. Mm -hmm. And then when I started researching on pro brewer forms, they are saying, you're crazy. Nobody ever takes those things apart. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pain in the butt. Are you yeah. kidding? Are you psycho? But we, we read the manual over and over again, did it, took put it back together, did it again, and now I'm very familiar and confident that those innards are, are quite clean. So. Yeah, and part of that, I think it'll create consistency. And I think in craft beer, one of the things that can separate a good brewer from a great brewer is being able to reproduce what they do. Like Absolutely. one of the criticisms I hear about a lot of new breweries is it's inconsistent. Some of it's amazing and some of it just seems off. So right. if you can keep that cleanliness in there and if you can really like dial in your yeast and your recipes and things like that, yeah. that's I think going to get people really excited. Yeah. So. Yeah. Somebody, one of my pro brewer friends told me once, he's like, if somebody comes in for a beer and they come back two, three months later, they shouldn't be able to tell much of a difference. No. But if they come in for a beer and they come back a year or two later, your, you know, your quality should have improved. I'm, I'm always striving for constant improvement. I'm my own worst critic. So every little batch, I'm, well, we'll I'm see. trying, to, tried them yet. I'm trying so to, I might try to tweak a little bit of it here and there. But uh, that change isn't so dramatic that the people in the short term will notice. Just over a longer period of time, we're looking to, you know, achieve excellence. That's great. And uh, is this, uh, do you foresee yourselves going more into that mold of sort of a California, a lot of like hoppy products? Are you really just going to try to go everywhere you possibly can? We're trying to go everywhere. I mean, I, I love the, the major double IPAs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that's one of my favorites. 
there is the, the hop shortage is a little limiting right now. I mean, I have hop contracts for the next year, but in the short term, I'm a little limited on my hop supply. But I'm just kind of working with what I got. But I also, you know, coming out of Belgium, just love that influence as well. So I, I really love what that yeast does to things, how it could mask 11% alcohol into something that just drinks like orange juice, and it's just uh, fantastic. So I'm probably going to focus mainly on, on the Belgian mm -hmm. side of things as well as your West Coast hop craze. I dig it. Well, uh, I'm really excited to, to dig into some of these beers as well, but uh, folks come out. Uh, have uh, have a nice little lesson from Dr. Hops here. Absolutely. And, Come uh, say hi. I'll be happy to give you a tour anytime. Dude, congratulations. I'm Thank very excited very for you. Absolutely. Thank you. And cut and then we'll